Welcome, everyone. Um, we're very pleased today to have uh, professors and students from Kyoto University in Japan here visiting Google. Um, we're going to have uh, Professor uh, Katsumi Tanaka give us an overview of the Department of Social Informatics, Graduate School of Informatics Research. And then we will have Professor Toro Ishida give us uh, an overview of the research at the Laboratory for Global Information Network Department at the School of Social Informatics. Uh, Professor Tanaka. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Katsumi Tanaka uh, from Kyoto University. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you kindly accepted our visit uh, to uh, Google. And uh, today, uh, I'd like to briefly uh, uh, introduce uh, the research activities in the uh, area of uh, web uh, search uh, of, uh, my, in my lab. And uh, first of all, uh, this is a list of uh, uh, students and, and professors and also researchers from Japan. Okay? And I came from uh, Japan, Japan, Kyoto University, and Professor Ishida also came from uh, Kyoto University. And we have uh, some uh, re researchers from a Japanese governmental research laboratory, NYCT. And also, there are many uh, uh, graduate students uh, of Kyoto University here. Okay, okay so uh, I hope uh, somebody in Google is watching me. Okay. <laughs> and uh, my, my topic is the, uh, towards next generation search engine and browser. So this is my image of uh, next generation search engine. Okay. Uh, maybe intuitively, the next image of a web search engine should be a search beyond media types and places. Okay. You can see that <coughs> this, uh, this horizontal axis, this, this means the place of uh, content storage. And uh, the vertical axis, this, is, this uh, axis denotes the media type of contents. Okay. So now uh, we have a text search engine and also image search engine or video search engine. Right. And uh, Google is already uh, offering uh, several types of uh, content search engine. So you, you are now going up. I mean, not only text data, but also image uh, retrieval and video retrieval. So uh, this this one this is one direction of conventional uh, web search engine, right? And uh, the next this horizontal uh, axis, this is very interesting. Uh, for me. I mean, currently uh, web search engine cover, uh, of course, uh, web contents include blog and also desktop contents, right? And maybe now uh, conventional web search engine is going from left to right slightly. Because uh, some uh, search engine is now able to recover not only web, not only personal contents on your desktop, but also external database or encyclopedia or GIS contents. Right? Now we are interested in this area. I mean, maybe uh, recently hard, uh, television hard disk and DVD recorder, they, they can store many contents. So then maybe sometime we will need some search engine to search the content stored in hard disk and DVD record. And even the search engine for PDA contents or digital camera, right? So this is another uh, axis, okay? So then in order to uh, image the next generation web search, uh, maybe we will need integrated search technology. And uh, maybe program contents into web-like contents, such kind of media conversion technology will be necessary. And uh, very fortunately, web content has hyperlinks. And so uh, Google uh, was successful to give a very new uh, ranking algorithm called PageRank. But unfortunately, for example, TV program contents in hard disk record, they don't have any hyperlinks, right? So then we may need some new non-link-based ranking mechanism, right? Okay. Okay, so then from now, I will uh, briefly sketch an overview 
of our research activities in the area of search engine yeah, or search technology. And one uh, direction is the integrated search. Okay? And this slide shows uh, this is a TV program. And uh, while watching a uh, TV program, you, you can automatically uh, obtain the related web page in real time. Okay? And I hear that uh, in Google Research Lab, uh, maybe uh, some researcher is also engaged in this kind of research, right? So this is one example of integrated search. I mean, while you can watch TV program, you can automatically uh, obtain related web page at the same time. Okay. And, uh, this is another example of integrated search. Uh, this is a combination of GIS contents and web contents. And uh, this system automatically detects some landmark places from web contents. Th that is based on uh, data mining technology. And then uh, landmark place is a very famous place in town or in any area. Okay. And furthermore, based on uh, those uh, landmark places, the system automatically retrieves web pages concerned with those landmark places. So this is another example of combination of GIS contents and web contents. The third one is an uh, uh, example of image search. And uh, I hope uh, some people in Google uh, listen to this story. Okay? Uh, th this is an example of Google image search. And uh, Google image search, now uh, the precision ratio of image search is very good, pretty good. But uh, the recall ratio of Google image search is not so bad, uh, it's not so good. Okay. And uh, this is one example. So you can, you can try later, okay? By using a Google image search engine, why not input three, just three keywords, Mount Fuji and sunset and snow. Okay, so then the answer of Google image search is zero. I mean, the number of hits is zero. Okay, okay so then can you believe that there's no images concerned with uh, Mount Fuji and sunset and snow in the World Wide Web big information space? The answer is no. There are many, many images concerned with Mount Fuji and sunset and snow. So then how do you improve the recall ratio of your image search engine. Okay, this is our um, basic, uh, simple idea. Our idea, uh, our idea is this: we will re relax this query keyword. Okay, so then we will uh, select Mount Fuji and sunset. Only these two keywords is input for Google image search, and the third keyword is input to ordinary uh, text search. I mean, we have uh, Google search. And then take an intersection of these two results. So then you can find many, many uh, relevant images concerned with the Mount Fuji and sunset and snow. Okay. So then you can you can discover many, many relevant images of this query. Right? This is our idea to improve your uh, Google image search engine, especially to improve the recall ratio. And uh, this is uh, another example of integrated search. Uh, we have already developed a search engine uh, to retrieve not only web contents, but also TV program contents. Okay. And uh, this is the one example. Now you can see the image, the video image of our search engine, which tries to retrieve uh, not only web pages, but also TV program contents for your query. Okay. Now, uh, the, oh, sorry, this is Japanese, but uh, the user is now uh, input the keyword space and space shuttle, right? So then this is the uh, answer. And you can see this is a web page, this is a web page, but uh, here 
this is a TV program content stored in your hard disk record. Okay. So then, once you input your keyword query, you can retrieve a web page. But furthermore, you can retrieve a TV program content. Right? And also, you can uh, browse uh, the uh, returned answer. Now, the user is now focusing of, of this uh, answer. This is the TV program content. And if you zoom up, then you can see the detail of the uh, TV program content. Okay. And also, uh, very recently, uh, young people in Japan, while they're watching TV, they're also using PC and internet. And especially, uh, they are communicating by online chat system. So this is uh, another example of integrated search which tries to integrate uh, not only TV pro program content, but also online chat information. This is also a very brief uh, introductory video of this system. And this is usual TV program. Okay, and maybe this is a user interface issue. If you zoom down, you know, zoom, zoom out, then you can see not only the TV program content, but also here is the closed caption data. And furthermore, here is the uh, online chat information uh, concerned with this portion of video program. Okay. So this is another example of integrated search or, or TV program content and online chat information. Okay. And uh, this is also another example of integrated search. We already explored, uh, developed some uh, browser which can concurrently browse multiple websites in a concurrent manner. Okay? Suppose that you are reading newspapers. Okay? So then you can, uh, in this system, you can read multiple uh, web news sites concurrently. And if you pick up, if you pick up uh, uh, some your favorite news, then the related uh, news article from other uh, news site is automatically retrieved. And uh, so this, this window is automatically synchronized with this window. So you, this is an image. I mean, you, 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 uh, on your desktop, uh, you can put two newspapers and then compare the related news articles. Okay, and uh, this is a ranking uh, algorithm issue. Okay, uh, currently even PageRank, PageRank algorithm is very new and a very very good algorithm to rank each web page. Right? Our idea is slightly different. Why, why do you rank web pages page by page? Okay. Our idea is uh, to rank uh, the collection of pages. I mean. Uh, we make page pairs from answer pages as units of a ranking. So the, the units for ranking is not each single page, but pair of pages, okay? So uh, here, here's some example. Suppose that your query is uh, UC Berkeley and Stanford, right? This means uh, maybe uh, you want to uh, compare uh, UC Berkeley and Stanford University. Okay, so just input the keyword, UC Berkeley and Stanford. So then uh, Google search engine will uh, return these pages as a candidate of the answer, okay? And uh, some page, uh, there, there's much more description about UC Berkeley, but very few description about Stanford, maybe. And uh, here, this page. This page describes um, many description about UC Berkeley, but very few, no, no. Uh, this page describes Stanford very much and very few description about UC Berkeley, okay? But maybe the intention of this query is the, the user wishes to compare UC Berkeley and Stanford, right? So then, why, why don't you make a pair of these pages? So that is our idea, uh, ma making a pair of pages by this and this, right? And this pair of page may be much more relevant to your query than each single page. That is the idea of ranking uh, page, you know, page uh, corrections, not page by page. Okay. All 
Right, so then I almost uh, talked about uh, a quick, uh, this is a quick review of our research activity. And also uh, we explored some new type of uh, browser, especially browsing for browsing multimedia contents. Okay. And uh, usually, uh, every day we are now using uh, uh, I, I, Internet Explorer, that is a web browser. And also now every day we watch TV. Okay, this is very useful. But our idea is the reverse. Okay. Why not watch the uh, web? Why not browse TV? In order to do that, okay, so some kind of media conversion technology is needed. I mean, transform web page into TV program like content, or conversely, transform. TV pro contents into web-like page, right? Okay, this is a very uh, watching or listening. This is a very passive manner to get information, right? And browsing is very active manner. Of course, uh, in Internet Explorer, every day we uh, click and we scroll up and down and even we read the text on the web page. But sometimes uh, if you're a player, right? Maybe sometimes we, would, we may wish to just watch and listen to it. Okay. So then conventional Internet Explorer interface, it is a very active uh, interface. So sometimes we may, we may wish to have a very uh, passive and TV-like uh, interface. Okay. And uh, here's uh, some example, okay. <coughs> This example is in the no voice, so sorry, but uh, this, uh, this one is an uh, uh, example of transforming some news article web page into TV program like content. Okay. So then these funny characters uh, speak each other. Uh, the topic is from some news article in some website. Right. So then users can just watch and listen. Something like a TV program. Okay. This is one example. If somebody uh, can understand Japanese, uh, th this is a very funny uh, dialogue. But uh, anyway, uh, sorry, this is in Japanese. Okay. And furthermore, no, no voice. Okay. And uh, maybe uh, so, uh, this technology can be used for mobile phone or some PDA. Okay. Because mobile phone and PDA, of course, there is very small screen. We, we do not you know, behave so actively. I mean, click and sc scroll up and down. You know. So then, maybe much more passive manner to read web page may be necessary. So then, this kind of technology can be used. And uh, this is a reverse, conversing uh, TV pro contents into web-like pages. Okay. Okay. I will show some this short. This is a very short demo, but this program is running on my PC now. Okay. And uh, this is very old news uh, from TV. Okay. You, you know who he is. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> okay, so this is a news program. Okay. But now, suppose that you are tired, you are boring to, to see uh, this news. So you want to search another news stored in your hard disk recorder. But uh, your hard disk recorder is huge. So it's already record, maybe uh, one year, all the TV programs of one, not one year, but one week, right? So then I want to search, quickly search, some uh, TV news stored in my hard disk recorder. So then our interface is this. Our interface automatically tries to convert this TV program into web-like pages, just zooming out. If you zoom out, right, so then, this TV program is, uh, you know, automatically transformed into something like a web page, right? And this text and this text, and these texts are extracted from closed caption, 
of DB program, right? And furthermore, automatically some hyperlinks is generated. Okay, so then you can quickly browse the whole content of your hard disk record, and you can select your favorite news uh, news article. And then again, you can if you zoom in, then you can you can watch. Finally, uh, we are now interested in the trust of web search. Okay. We have just started uh, this research. Uh, the, the problem is, uh, to what extent can we believe the result of web search engine, right? Even if uh, your uh, Google image search engine or Google search engine, uh, the very good ranking algorithm is existing, but but then, to what extent can we believe that the top top one page is based or not? That is the problem of trust of web search. Okay? And uh, in order to consider the trust of web search engine, uh, maybe we have we should consider three items. The one is the concerned with the content itself. I mean, the search the search page. So how does a search page offer fair information? Okay. In order to analyze this, of, of course, we can uh, use several data mining technology, right? And the second one, the second axis is the social acceptance. I mean, if you have some web page as a search result, right, so then how do people evaluate the web page? And this, this is uh, not so new. I mean, Google page rank algorithm. This is one way to represent the degree of social acceptance of web page, right? But uh, maybe we may be able to explore other technology in order to consider the trust of such web pages. And the third axis is also reliability. This means that if you are given uh, some web page that is a top line, right, for your uh, query, but uh, you cannot know uh, how the author elaborate to create a web page or bookmarks or something. So then maybe some technology will be needed to guess how can we trust the authors of the web page. Okay? This is very important. Okay, so I have no time. So uh, I, today I have some materials, I mean and by papers, so uh, much more details. Uh, if you're interested, then you can refer, you can see. Okay, so, so, so anyway, <laughs> okay, so this is my conclusion. Uh, in, in order to imagine uh, the next generation search image, I uh, pinned down uh, several issues, especially uh, towards next generation, maybe cross-media search, beyond media types and places. This is very important, I think. And so then, uh, maybe the browsing style may be different, or may become a much more variety. Okay? And furthermore, trust of search will be much more important. Okay. All right. So then, in order to uh, you know, realize uh, this kind of uh, image, uh, I also pin down uh, some basic technologies we are now exploring. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, coming here. Thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce Professor Toro Ashida from the Department of Social Informatics of Kyoto University, who's going to talk to us about Language Grid, which is an infrastructure for intercultural collaboration. Professor? Good afternoon. I'm Toro Ishida from Kyoto University. And I'd like to talk about uh, my research plan. It's not a research result, but a plan for uh, language grid and infrastructure for intercultural collaboration. So let me start with my motivation. So we have done a so-called intercultural collaboration experiment from 2002, 
And so I want to talk about why I want to start a language grid project. And then I will talk about a language grid architecture, including language service ontology and language web services. And uh, I want to work with various NPOs in Japan, including uh, hospital support for foreign patients, university playgrounds, universal playgrounds for kids around the world, and multilingual radio program for disaster management. So we will work on uh, this uh, project with uh, three NPOs. Okay, here is a motivation. The question is, do we really share information on the web? It seems to us no standard languages on the internet now. Uh, this is the online language population survey in September 2004. Uh, from this survey, it seems English population is 35%, European languages population is more than 29%, and Asian languages is more than 26%. So we have to learn a lot, a lot of languages to understand web information. But it is because it is impossible, we want to try to use a machine translation. And if we use machine translation, we get uh, uh, such a result. If human, if human translator translate, don't worry, it's nothing, then the machine translator may say not killing trivial problems are good. So the question is what happens when we use machine translation in intercultural collaboration? And we did an experiment in 2002 and are uh, still continuing this experiment also in 2005. And so the experiment in 2002 is to develop open source software in Asian countries in our first languages. And five universities from Asia joined this project, including Shanghai Jotun University, Seoul National University, Handan University, University of Malaysia, and Kyoto Universities. And in this experiment, team members never meet in person, but complete software with multilingual communication tools, like web and BBS with machine translations. We did a fairly long experiment from April 2002 to December 2002. And uh, language services were available, but we had a hard time to organize, to create the, the language services uh, for this experiment. Uh, this is so-called uh, translation pentagon we used in uh, 2002. Uh, we used five languages, Japanese, English, Chinese, Korean, and Malay, and we need a machine translator to cover those languages. A lot of questions were there. How can we collect translation engines to cover five languages? How can we understand their contracts? It's the contracts uh, differ, and uh, um, sometimes it's really hard for us to understand. And how do we evaluate their services? There is no quality assurance in machine translation. How much should we pay for covering the five languages? It's a lot. So usually a million yen for each language pair. And how can we customize provided services? And then we decided to start the project called Language Glade. We believe that language is still the biggest problem in, the, in intercultural collaboration. Though English becomes a world standard language, people don't use it in it in local activities. The language barrier is serious, especially in Asia, because we are not taught our neighboring languages. So I mean that uh, Japanese are not taught uh, Chinese or Koreans, 
And in China, so people are not told Japanese or Korean and so on. And language services are often not accessible and usable. Only big organizations like Google can buy services and create their own services. But if uh, uh, so people in NPOs or universities want to create their own language services, we have a lot of difficulties to uh, access and use those services. And so our goal is to create a language grid as an infrastructure of the internet. And we want to improve accessibility and the usability of language services to, to create, to develop our own language services. So here is a language grid architecture. We have uh, two different goals. One is, uh, one is called horizontal language grid to provide standard language services worldwide to create composite services by connecting existing language services on, upon user's request and to develop service ontology to standardize their interface. And another goal is vertical language grid to create community language services to support intercultural activities. So this is a language grid architecture. So we have a horizontal language grid connecting uh, standard language services, including WordNet. Uh, it's an uh, English dictionary provided from by uh, Princeton University, or EDR. Uh, this is provided by uh, NICT in Japan, or Chinese dictionary or machine translations between uh, the main languages. And also we have a vertical language grid uh, to support community activities, uh, it's including it's like uh, medical support, interpretation support in the local hospitals. So we will work on the language service ontology to standardize APIs of existing language services. And, to, and I mean that uh, language services is uh, including uh, language resources and uh, also a language processing functions like translation, paraphrasing, and so on. And we want to create community language services easily by using those service ontologies. And we also work on the language web services. Um, so now, as you know, the standardization is in progress for web services and research in progress and semantic web services. Our goal is to create a human agent collaboration to create composite language services. And uh, we want to uh, generate semantic wrapper for nearly newly created language services. So here is uh, language web service architecture, including three layers. Uh, the bottom layer is language service layer. Uh, including an atomic component and composite component and so on. And the second layer is a scenario execution layer. Uh, so this is uh, semantic web services using a BPAL, WSDL, UDDI, and R. And top layer is called scenario collaboration layer. We will make a repository for service scenario and the semantic wrappers. And we are now implementing a language grid prototype, uh, hopefully by the end of March this year. So let me introduce in a few field work, field studies we are planning with NPOs. So we are planning to work with NPOs, uh, especially three purposes. One is hospital support for foreign patients. The second one is universal playground for kids around the world. And the third one is multilingual radio program for disaster management. So let me quickly review the three cases. The first one is uh, the medical 
interpretation services at uh, local hospitals. And uh, the name of the NPO is Center for Multicultural Information and Assistance, located in Kyoto. So this NPO started a uh, medical interpretation service from uh, September 2003 to assist foreign patients. And at this moment, Chinese and Portuguese are highly needed. And uh, in this case, translation should be very accurate. And machine translation is not useful for this purpose because uh, the low quality, it's low quality. And so we need uh, to use multilingual parallel texts. And they want to develop their own language resources useful, also useful for local hospitals. So this is an image how we will use language grid for this purpose. So suppose uh, uh, here is a parallel, multilingual parallel text for medical use. And NPO also wants to create multilingual parallel text for some local hospital use. And if we have a similarity evaluation program for two sentences, uh, we can easily create an, uh, uh, composite services by using a workflow to assist interpreter volunteers. The second case is, uh, is uh, the NPO, the name of NPO is called Panjir, and they want to create an universal playground for world kids. And the NPO is, was launched in Tokyo by researchers from M MIT Media Labs, and activities are ongoing in Tokyo and Kyoto. Overseas branches are in Korea, and Kenya, and Australia, Austria, and so on. And they are now collecting pictograms drawn by kids around the world. And that means they are uh, developing their own language resources, so pictogram repositories, and grounding, grounded on the world net. So this is uh, the pictogram language resources grounding on the world net. So they are trying to uh, connect uh, pictograms to the, the concept of the, in the world net. So uh, this example shows and how pictograms uh, differ, uh, different in the different countries. So, uh, so for example, this one, this pictogram, the meaning is the morning in Japan but uh, it seems that this pictogram doesn't mean morning uh, in Kenya. In Kenya, the morning should be like this. So they started to, uh, to ground the meaning of the pictogram using the word net. So this is a new language resource created by NPO. So we, f we have a language grid and uh, uh, people can put their own language resources on the language grid, then suppose if we have any standard language services like a Japanese Korean translation, Korean morphological analysis, and then we can, again, we can create, easily create a workflow to create new services uh, like this. So suppose the uh, uh, Japanese kid, kids input a Japanese sentence here, and then this workflow can translate it into a Japanese sentence with uh, pictograms, and then uh, translate it into a Korean sentence with pictograms. So the important thing is uh, this mechanism allow NPOs to create their own language services by using their own language resources with standard language services. So third case is, uh, th the name of the NPO is Kyoto Com Community Radio. This NPO started in March 2003, the first FM radio station by NPO in Japan. And the radio program production workshops are organized by foreign residents, 
from May 2005 to make radio program in various languages and especially uh, they want to gather and broadcast information in various languages in case of disaster like big earthquake. So here is an example. So suppose uh, they are different pe peoples from different countries uh, using a different language to create a uh, radio program production. So, so they want to need some uh, multilingual blackboard system. And again, so they can easily create uh, using uh, available standard language services like a Japanese English translation and English mor morphological analysis or English Hindi dictionary and so on. The point is again, they can create their language, their own language services for their own purposes. Okay, here is an assembly. So I introduce an architecture of language grid to increase accessibility and usability of language services. It includes two different kinds of language grids, horizontal one for connecting nation standard languages and vertical one for creating community language services. And we hope that an impact of the language grid uh, is fairly big. Language services will not be created just by professionals, but by local communities. I think uh, we want to um, make a positive spirals of creation, usage, and the standardization of language services. Okay, thank you very much. So here is a contributors. This is a fairly uh, uh, multidisciplinary work. And uh, so people are from uh, different areas, including natural language processing, AI, agents, and uh, sociologies, and uh, collaborations, and so on. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.